So now that we know how to form amines and aminium ions, the question is, what do these things do? What is the reactivity pattern that we expect from an amine or an aminium ion? And really, they are analogous, um, for the most part, to carbonyls. Okay, so we have now come to expect that a carbonyl will react with nucleophiles. Okay, um, and if we convert a carbonyl to an imine, let's say, okay, whatever this is going to be, um, it turns out these will also react with nucleophiles. Okay, and and for the same reasons, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, and so there's going to be that that lower uh, pi star orbital. Um, but they're less reactive than uh, carbonyls. Right? So these are these are less reactive. And hopefully that makes sense. Uh, nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. Um, and so if you if you think about what happens after you've added the nucleophile, um, in the case of the carbonyl, you have an O minus intermediate. In the case of the imine, what you would have to generate is an N minus, and that is just simply a lot less stable than an O minus. So they're less uh, electrophilic than carbonyls. On the other hand, um, if we can access the aminium ion form, either the you know by protonation or if this was a secondary amine, um, and we can get this to a cation, these now are actually significantly more reactive, more reactive than than either of these. And um, if you if you think about the uh, the uh, product that would result from the addition of a nucleophile to an aminium ion, uh, you can see here that this would be neutral, right? So rather than forming any anion, you go from a cation to a neutral species. And so that uh, is obviously gonna be a lot more favorable. So aminium ions here are the most reactive. And so a lot of the chemistry that um, imines uh, participate in are, are actually uh, going through the aminium ions. So we can put an imine in um, and get it to access the aminium ion, that's going to be the most reactive species. In the exact same way that in carbonyl chemistry, if we protonate a carbonyl and we get to an oxocarbenium, that's much more reactive than the carbonyl. Okay? All right, so what can we do with imines and aminium ions? Um, there's actually there's two uh, reactions that uh, we want to talk about right now. The aminium ions do a lot of things. We'll talk about a few more in later sections in the course. Um, but the first one that I want to show is a very useful process called reductive amination. Reductive amination. And what's going to happen here is I'm going to take a aldehyde or ketone and I'm going to treat it with uh, an amine. And this could actually be a secondary amine or a primary amine. Um, I'll just go ahead and show the, the, um, primary mean uh, for illustration purposes. And then I'm going to throw in a specific reducing agent called sodium cyanoborohydride. Okay, sodium cyanoborohydride. And then um, we're also going to have some somewhat mild acid. So acetic acid um, would probably work pretty well here. And what's going to happen out of this reaction is we'll reduce the, uh, the imine that forms here and we'll actually get an amine product. Okay, so that's why it's called a, a reductive amination because we're we're uh, converting the carbonyl to an amine under reductive conditions. So what happens here is actually somewhat elegant in terms of its selectivity. So we have a carbonyl, um, and you know from our uh, our discussion and the synthesis of alcohols that carbonyls can be reduced by hydride reagents to form alcohols and sodium cyanoborohydride uh, is in fact a hydride donor, right? So this is, it's gonna be analogous to uh, sodium borohydride, except there's one slight difference where we've got this cyano group that's stuck on the boron, okay? So this is minus, and this in, uh, potentially has this ability to, to donate a hydride. But it turns out that because of this uh, cyano group, the cyano group is a strong electron withdrawing group. And what it does is it reduces the electron density of the, of the borohydride. So it basically makes it a crappy hydride donor. 
right? It's not so good at reducing things. So it isn't reactive enough to reduce the carbonyl. So you can throw the carbonyl in with sodium, sodium cyanoborohydride and nothing happens, right? That's very useful because then at the same time, we can have our amine around, and this is going to be you know, catalyzed by the mild acid here, acetic acid, and we can, we can basically set up an equilibrium um, where we're, we're generating a protonated aminium ion Okay, so there's our there's our protonated aminium ion, right? And and this this is sort of um, forming and hydrolyzing back and forth. Um, the aminium ion actually isn't that stable, so it's forming and unforming, and forming and unforming. But only in this case, when the aminium ion is formed, is it now reactive enough for the hydride to reduce. Okay, so now you can reduce uh, with the sodium cyanoborohydride because the aminium ion is more reactive. And lo and behold, here we have our reduced product, okay? And that's how you can get this, this selectivity is by using just sort of a finely tuned, um, weak hydride reducing agent um, under conditions where the carbonyl doesn't get reduced, but the aminium ion does. So it's a really elegant and beautiful um, sort of bit of selectivity. So reductive amination um, is a very useful reaction and allows you now to convert carbonyls to amines. Now, aminium ions can be um, electrophilic with other types of um, nucleophiles. And um, one that you now have a lot of experience with is aromatic rings. So if you can uh, generate an aminium ion with a sufficiently nucleophilic aromatic ring, you can actually form a carbon-carbon bond. Um, and the most famous and well-known um, reaction that involves this type of reactivity is something that's called the pictet spengler reaction Spengler okay and this reaction is important for organic synthesis as a field um, it happens in nature um, and it even happens in um, uh, food uh, products such as soy sauce so this this will happen between amino acids and, and sugars that are in something like soy sauce so you'll get pictet Spengler um, products um, when you're having your sushi so what does this look like? Well, there's a number of different forms, but probably the most um, widespread one actually involves um, an aromatic um, known as an indole, uh, which you might remember. Okay, so there's an indole, and this actually is tethered to the amine um, that's going to uh, be engaged in the aminium ion formation. Okay, so this is, this is the amine, and then it's tethered to the thing that's going to be the nucleophile. Um, and by the way, this is uh, derived from tryptophan, the amino acid tryptophan. It just gets decarboxylated and you get to this amine. What happens is this will react with an aldehyde of whatever type. And so this is the thing that could be something like glucose or, or another sugar, but it can also work with, you know, essentially any aldehyde. Um, and it's going to involve a proton, um, as we've seen. Um, and essentially what happens I'll show you the overall transformation first. Is you end up forming the imine between that amine and the carbonyl to get an aminium ion, and then you essentially do an electrophilic aromatic substitution on that aminium ion. Okay, so that's the pictet spengler reaction. So let's just very quickly um, see these intermediates drawn out. And we won't go through the, the mechanism of imine formation, aminium ion formation um, again. But if you, again, if you want more practice, you could feel free to uh, take on that task. Okay, so here, here is the aminium ion we would form from this amine and that aldehyde with proton. It's certainly reversible. And then at this point, uh, what we can do is to use this aromatic to now do our electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. Okay, so here. There we 
just formed our carbon-carbon bond. Okay, that's the key step. And then, of course, we have a cation. And so then all we're going to do right, is very quickly regain aromaticity and we get to our final product. Okay, so that's the Pictet Spangler. And this aromatic ring can be different things. Um, maybe there'll be a case on, or two on the problem set uh, where you can you can take a look at this. Now, uh, the, I should point out, this is a, a minor detail, but I should point out that if you go and you, you look up the Pictet Spangler, specifically on uh, these indole uh, substrates, there's controversy about whether it actually adds at this carbon or whether it adds at this one and then does a rearrangement. Um, I'm just showing this case because I think it's the most straightforward, but know that uh, I do understand uh, that there is uh, very likely this alternative mechanism. Um, and, and so if you're interested, you can look into this, but for, for us, this one will suffice because it's the most direct uh, EAS route to get to here, okay? So you can see the Pictet Spengler involves a fair bit of complexity. We're, we're generating not only an amine, uh, but also, um, in this case, a ring. Um, uh, I, I, all all Pictet Spenglers uh, generate uh, cyclic amines um, and along with a stereo center. Uh, so there's kind of a lot going on here. Um, and it turns out that Pictet Spengler has been um, actually used quite a lot to make very complex molecules by organic chemists. So these are just two examples of the electrophilic chemistry of imines and aminium ions. Um, we'll certainly see these uh, again later in the semester, uh, but for now these two will suffice.